I think I should begin with my last slide because it's the most important and very often I don't reach it. <laughs> well, first of all, I have Ken Lewis and Feynman for showing me their spin quantization for space time long before they were published. And then there's a list of frames they will go to. And I want to thank the Institute and Professor Goodberg for inviting me to this magnificent meeting and for arranging such lovely weather. So I guess the basic idea is that quantization is a process of eliminating radicals. Um, it began as a process of making divergent theories finite. Planck had to make the heat capacity of an orbit finite. But that's not what we call quantization today. That's really a kind of discretization. And the real quantization begins with Heisenberg, who recovered results from a deeper uh, position involving changing the very Lie algebras on which they were fixed. And he started with a theory in which the observables have the most singular possible Lie algebra you can imagine. They're commutative. They're all radicals. And he whittled the radical down to the real axis. And um, I think it was Siegel who first realized that this is an important process in the evolution of physics. That physics is evolving toward the simple, the radical free theory. And he saw the spectral position. There's also an elimination of radicals. In the Lorentz group, sorry, in the Galilean group, the velocities are in the radical. And the Lorentz group is simple. They're gone. So even without philosophical preconceptions, this technique that has given such fabulous results for two occasions is worth trying now and then. Let's get rid of the radicals, and maybe we'll make the theory more finite. I think Siegel gave a beautiful Darwinian argument for this process, which I would like to repeat. Even though it doesn't completely hold water, it only leaks a little. Namely, some of the algebras are labile and some are stable. That means if you look at the structure tension and change it ever so slightly, does that change the Lie algebra itself or merely carry out the isomorphism? And if it results in mutation, as in E. coli near the, in, in high temperatures, we'll call it Lie algebra labile. And if it doesn't change Lie algebra, it's stable. And Galileo and Newton and, alas, even Heisenberg are labile. And the simple Lie algebras are all stable. Now, I first Where met... There's work to be done. And uh, I, I must say I indeed. I must say I've undertaken this process of de radicalization. And uh, the first meeting I had with Chagdar was with Pierre Alderdon in 1967. And neither of us had had the thoughts then that make our meeting today so important and pleasurable. And I'm just very glad to be able to present to him some of the really important implications of his brilliant thoughts. Let me start with a remark of Heisenberg that the fundamental problem of physics today is the structure of the vacuum. The minute I heard this, I believed it. Before that, I the fundamental problem of physics of discovering the law of nature 
and it really too much ice time. But it seems that studying the structure of the vacuum is actually blocked by the Heisenberg commutation relations, which guarantee the continuity of space-time. It has seemed to many that this continuity is the same kind of smoothing approximation of a more discrete structure as the hydrodynamics is a smoothing approximation to the theory of water, which is actually molecular. So the question arises, what are the atomic elements of space-time? In a relativistic theory, it's enough to find atomic elements of time. Let me call these, therefore, chronons. I've stolen the word from Margaret Howe, who used it for a unit. I reserve the suffix O-N for the quantum entity itself. And the immediate question, then, is what are the statistics of the chronon? Um, the Heisenberg relations deny its existence. The event of space-time does not have observable coordinates in quantum theory. One can't be all the operators do not have eigenvectors in the Hilbert space itself. At least the pile of statistics allows you to measure a coordinate, maybe several coordinates. So it gives much more reality to the idea of an event. And I think the question of what, are the, what is the statistics of the chronon is an open door to a new entry of Lee algorithm of physics even more important than SU3. So this is the general philosophy. <laughs> you know, the first thing is that space, time, and fields lie on different levels of abstraction. In the language of Russell, they belong to different types. You increase the type of something when you put it in curly braces. When you go from an entity to the set containing that entity. And all of existing quantum theory is on one level of abstraction the dynamical level. If we're going to talk about a quantum theory, which is quantum on several levels, we have to quantize the deeper levels as well. And possibly, without giving up the type distinction, they should be deeper after quantization also. And this requires a type quantum theory. And the easiest way to do that is to start with a type particle theory, First, I should define power statistics. We start with Lie algebra, and the crucial thing is that it should not be a compound Lie algebra in the language of Siegel. It should not be non-semi-simple. And Siegel calls such Lie algebra as compound. And semi-simple is the opposite of compound. <coughs> so the important thing about all statistics might be expressed in Lie algebra. The important thing about power statistics is the right-hand side, so to speak, is not singular, is not compound, it's semi-simple. And in fact, study can well begin with the simple ones. Uh, they've actually been studied in several contexts without people realizing entirely what they were doing. In Siegel's first paper on this subject, he replaced the Heidenberg algebra of P, Q, and I by what I call the rotator algebra of P, Q, and R. <coughs> so you could say he quantized I. It's no longer in the center, replaced by an operator which is in fact indistinguishable from P and Q. He certainly didn't think of himself as doing statistics at that time. He was quantizing a harmonic oscillator, perhaps. And this brings us back to an ancient debate about the validity of the name second quantization. <coughs> At first, it looked as if one was taking, say, the Schrodinger equation, treating psi as a variable of the system, even though it isn't, and quantizing that variable. 
And very quickly, intelligent people pointed out that this is not quantization. It doesn't introduce a new quantum constant. It merely goes from one to many. The process of going from one to many, from yes or no questions to how many questions, was called quantification, a very good name, by Sir William Hamilton in 1850. And I propose to hold on to it. The question is, what is the relation between quantization and quantification? And the first impulse is to identify quantification with quantization. That's wrong, but underlying it is a truth that they have something to do with each other. And if you look at the harmonic oscillator, you realize it can be looked at either way. When you quantize it, you're quantizing it. But if you think of the harmonic oscillator as a collection of phonons, when you quantize it, you're quantifying the phonon. And so it's not that they're both quantizations. They're both quantifications. To put it differently, statistics is everything. And I'm going to suggest that power statistics <coughs> are in fact. And all the singular statistics, the labeler ones, are limiting cases. Good approximations, maybe you will always need them, but to do calculations. What does quantification mean? Discretization? Going from a theory which talks about the properties of an individual, yeah. like a single phase pass, ah, okay. to a theory which talks about an ensemble of similar individuals like the many body phase space. Yes, so, it, exactly, it's what used to be called improperly second quantization. Really, quantization should be called first quantification. <laughs> and then, uh, the example of Siegel immediately raised the question of how the rotator composed of angular momentum LZ becomes the imaginary eye of Heisenberg, totally breaking the symmetry between P, Q, and R, between LX, LY, and LZ. And the answer, there's only one answer we know today, there must be some spontaneous self-organization. A magnetic field polarizes the system along the z-axis, which is then called I. One component of the angular momentum becomes essentially classical because there are so many quanta aligned in making up the sum, which is that angular momentum component. And then all of Heisenberg physics is studying very small departures from this polarized state, in which, thanks to its quadratic nature, you don't even notice the changes in y that are going on. You just see the small changes in LX and L1, which very approximately, which very accurately obey the Heisenberg commutation relations, as long as they are small. But the underlying polyp statistics bounds them, and the Heisenberg statistics does not. So the Heisenberg statistics, sorry, the bose einstein statistics, I'll, I'll make this mistake many times, because the commutation, the Lee algebra is the same. The Heisenberg statistics make the problem divergent. And the claim is that all the infinities that riddle modern field theory arise from mistaking Apollo statistics as the Heisenberg statistics. Because that's so much easier to work with at first. Mm. Especially the Heisenberg computation relations have really only one useful representation. You can avoid all the representations there. Whereas any Apollo statistics has an infinite number of representations, and you have to do some experiments to find out which is the right one. You don't inherit it from the classical theory anymore. 